welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 5 of the Mad in America podcast. Thank you so much for getting in touch and sharing your thoughts, feedback and comments with me. If you want to discuss the podcast, you can now visit madinamerica.com forward slash forums. This week we have an interview with Monica Cassani. Monica has seen the mental health system from both sides, as a social worker and as a person whose life was severely ruptured by psychiatric drugs. She writes critically about the system as well as about holistic pathways of healing without medication. Monica's website, Everything Matters Beyond Meds, is a comprehensive library of information containing more than 5,000 blog posts, information articles, videos, personal experiences, and shares many natural methods of self-care for finding and sustaining health in body, mind, and spirit. Her blog also deals with wider issues in the socio-political and spiritual realms as they pertain to mental health and human rights issues surrounding psychiatry. I was keen to ask Monica about her own experiences of the psychiatric system, how a person's sensitivity can be affected by psychiatric treatment, and how she helps and supports others to achieve health in body, mind and spirit. Monica, thank you so much for talking with me today. Firstly, for the listeners, could you give us a little bit about your own background and how you first came into contact with the psychiatric system? Well, it goes back to when I was a very young woman. I I was at UC Berkeley and... I did some experimentation with what gets referred to as recreational drugs and had what got labeled as a manic episode, and I was hospitalized. And I went back and forth for about five years with doctors essentially forcing drugs on me. I was forced treated repeatedly and, and, and quitting and doing okay in between, and then something would arise and I would feel challenged again, and I sought alternatives, but at that time, it was pre-internet. I I just didn't find anybody that could give me the support I needed, which is why I do the work today, because I want people to have choices, and basically, I ended up feeling like I didn't have a choice because I didn't get alternative support, which I would have responded to very well. I mean, in retrospect, understanding what I know now, I did have some crises that were pretty extreme. And those are the times when, you know, targeted, very brief drug use might be appropriate. But certainly beyond that, it's basically, in my opinion, virtually never appropriate to keep people drugged on maintenance doses of any psychiatric drug. And that's what happened to me. And once I finally succumbed to their brainwashing. I mean, they scared me. They threatened me with the asylum, a state hospital. And another psychiatrist actually yelled at me on a psych ward telling me that if I didn't take drugs for the rest of my life, I would die. (laughs) Ironically, I almost died as a result of the drugs. I was on death's bed for a couple years. I couldn't speak. I was non, I was nonverbal. I, I became completely, um, atrophied. I had no muscle tension. I was literally bedridden. I could make it to the bathroom for the toilet. And that was about it. And I couldn't be on my feet for more than two or three minutes. It was horrible. And that went on for a couple of years. So yeah, I am now that I'm drug free and I've been drug free for eight years. I lose track seven or eight years. And, and, uh, basically it's clear that I needed, uh, other support. I have no demonstrable mania, nothing, nothing, none of that stuff left. I mean, I've done a lot of work on myself and I, and, and certainly the withdrawal process created all sorts of chaos and mood changes and stuff, but that stuff's worked out and it could have been worked out without the damage of the drugs when I was a young woman. It's a source of inner turmoil, isn't it? That had we been presented with options way back at the start, we would have made very different decisions about our health and well-being. But instead, we have to collude with medical professionals who we trust and to find that that trust is misplaced really hurts, doesn't it? It's excruciating. It's a massive betrayal. And yeah, coming back from that as much as anything else. I mean, it's it's PTSD. The PTSD that's incurred after being severely injured by people you trust, the medical system um, and therapists, whoever, you know, you find out that the entire system has betrayed you in ways so profound. It's earth shattering. It's life shattering. And and it does cause severe PTSD in conjunction with the 
the brain damage and neuro, you know, autonomic nervous system damage that also in and of itself, just because of how sick we are, causes PTSD. So it's just layers and layers of trauma. And, and usually when we come to, to need in the eyes of those who give them to us, these drugs, most of us have some trauma in our histories to begin with. And these drugs seem to actually ingrain those neural pathways in our brains all the more rather than help they ingrain them deeper and deeper and deeper so when you come off you have all that much more work to do rather than i mean it's, it's insane it's there's it's completely insane it's a painful irony isn't it that a chemical response to trauma and distress just leads to more trauma and distress on top of that that we already haven't managed to deal with that's right and monica can i ask how long was it that you were taking your cocktail of psychiatric drugs well, I was on one of the largest cocktails I've ever seen in my life, and that says a lot because I worked with the so-called severe and persistent mentally ill in the social service um, system in um, California. Um, my cocktail was bigger, and every single drug I was on it was higher um, doses. I was on five different drugs, every category of psych med, and um, yeah, and and the therapeutic, the, the doses were the maximum and beyond the maximum of what is considered therapeutic in the literature. It was completely insane. I, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't have any. It just happened, and it was just one thing after another. Once I succumbed and, and gave into them, and it did take some time. Then it was my only recourse. It was the only thing I had. And every, and I kept having more and more side effects. And the doctor I had, um, continued to give me additional drugs to take care of the side effects. He never took me off of anything. So it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah, another, yeah, total insanity. And you know, my doctor was very well reputed, actually a nice man. I mean, once I colluded with him, it was as much my problem as his. But yeah, I mean, he didn't have any, that was his only bag of tricks. He had a hammer and I was the nail and boom, 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 until I was basically, before the drugs destroyed my capacity to even be on my feet, I could, you know, I slept 14 hours a night. I was working full time. It was, it was completely unsustainable. And I finally crashed and burned and realized I had to come off the entire cocktail, which is what I did after about 25 years. Coming off even a single psychiatric drug after that period of time is a bigger challenge than many people will ever face in their lives. But to come off a cocktail of drugs is an even bigger challenge. How did you approach that? You know, it just was something that deep inside of me realized I had to do it. And, and I became incredibly focused on making it happen. And um, my work, it you know, arose out of that. And since I had a long history in social services as a social worker and case manager, I was able to not only speak to my personal heinous experience, but I was able to speak to what I saw happening when I worked. And um, in spite of, you know, being drugged to the gills, I did work in um, pretty uh, enlightened you know, for the system programs. So, you know, harm reduction programs that did respect people's choices, at least on paper. It didn't always happen in terms of practice because people are trained so thoroughly and brainwashed in their, you know, social work training, their psychology training, their psychiatry training, whatever it is they're getting to drug people. But the, the, the actual philosophy behind at least a couple of the programs, not all of them that I worked in, um, was one of harm reduction. So people were allowed, again, mostly in theory and sometimes and, and often in practice. I mean, I certainly was drawn to those programs because it was something I believed. So even in my work, when I was taking all these drugs, I was working for programs that said people had choice. And that was important to me, even at that time. So I had the roots of my rebellion in me from the beginning it was and 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 so yeah it just stayed with me and finally I realized it was killing me and I saw what it was doing to pe my clients and I was always heartbroken I had clients dying on these drugs this happens all the time it's just not routinely talked about I was devastated all the time because of what was happening in the lives of my clients it was it was painful and I loved my clients and it was excruciating to see what was happening too often. So yeah, I just finally emancipated myself from the whole thing. And I am emancipated. I don't, 
use the system at all, and and uh, and that feels good and right. Well, it's an incredible achievement, Monica, because what I've heard from others is what a lonely and isolating experience withdrawal can be, partly because people are forced to go against medical advice and becoming non-compliant as far as the doctors are concerned, and you end up in a place where you have to self-support. It can be a lonely, tough slog, and I just wanted to ask what kept you motivated during that time. Well, yeah, first I want to underscore and agree with you that it's an excruciatingly lonely and painful uh journey and people don't understand or relate to the extreme nature of our symptoms. Even if we're not bedridden and nonverbal like I was, people just have the most heinous nervous system pain and terror that just blows away what anybody has ever experienced in the name of anxiety and, you know, all sorts of extreme uh, feelings that that are completely drug-induced. It's a brain injury, essentially. And this is not appreciated, even among those who are often critical of psychiatry, there's no real profound appreciation of what we go through. We are the fringe of the fringe, I'd say. I mean, not everybody has this, you know, protracted, these protracted, horrible uh, symptoms. And so though, anyway, it just doesn't get appreciated pretty much anywhere. And uh, and so this is why your program is so vitally important, because you are helping um, get that information out there. What kept me going largely was my work and my comrades who were also dealing with this. Not only did they inform me as I helped, you know, educate others with my writing, they sustained me. And even now it works that way. You know, um, I couldn't have done this and I wouldn't have done it without my peers all over the world. And it wouldn't have happened if the internet didn't exist. And I'm very, very grateful for the internet. And that's how my work arose. I I write. Well, you really made me think, Monica, when you said earlier that around the time of your initial contact with psychiatry, that was at a time where we didn't have the internet. And so communities of those with experiences of these issues existed, but was so much more difficult to find. And so to get an alternative view was so much more difficult. That's right. I mean, I think those pockets existed, but they were harder to tap into and find. You know, if you're inclined to look for it, you can find it. So. Thank you. And Monica, I wanted to refer to an excellent article on Beyond Meds, your website, and also on Mad in America 2, which talks about hypersensitivity. And there's a brilliant passage by Oliver Sacks, author of the book The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Again, that got me thinking because I've been accused by my own doctors in the past of being too sensitive to medications, and that led me to thinking that it was me that was the problem and not the drugs. But your writing made me question that and think that maybe there are occasions where being hypersensitive in response to things might be a positive thing, and I just wondered what you felt about that. Well, hypersensitive is a little much, I would say, but sensitive, and those of us who end up with these conditions I think are all sensitive you know it's a spectrum of but just being sensitive is a is a wonderful thing it's a it's being in tune it's it's the capacity to be in tune with uh, all sorts of profound uh, things about our nature as human beings and animals and part of the universe that's how it's become clear to me and that's how I've healed by tapping into those capacities but hypersensitivity is also it goes too far there are gifts in hypersensitivity as well but but my hypersensitivity is part of my drug damage i mean i'm you i'm doing the best i can because i have no choice to utilize it in a way that that helps and it does that it's so extreme at this point my hypersensitivity became the object of my meditation and um once when if you spend hours and hours and hours of meditation time concentrating on what's going on in your body which is what I've done you start noticing and learning things about your body and about bodies in general and that's what's happened for me and that's where that's the source of pretty much everything I do so I have turned it around and I use it as a strength but it's not something I would recommend to anybody because it's excruciating it remains excruciating I'm often have to be a shut in in the house because I I have so much stimulus coming in at me at once. I can't sort through it, uh, in a way that, uh, I mean, I, there are times when I can, but if I'm not well rested, it becomes overwhelming. It's too much data. It's, it's not that there's anything delusional about it. It's just 
too much data at once and it's hard to uh, figure it all out. Now, part of the healing process for me is learning how to manage it. And as I heal my body, it becomes easier and easier. And I suspect eventually my functionality will be, you know, similar to that of normal sensitive people. Um, at, At this point, it's still problematic in terms of functioning like people expect healthy people to function. Now, I would argue that in some ways I'm far more healthy than I've ever been in my life and far more healthy than the average person in terms of my clarity and all sorts of things. On the other hand, I can't function in the way that society expects people to function. And that's a problem and it's not something I enjoy. So, you know, it's got its good things and it's bad sides as well. I can understand that. And it does strike me that sensitive people often go to the doctor for help in managing that sensitivity. And they're often given drugs which have a numbing effect. And of course, when they stop that medication, those sensitivities come back in a rush and probably multiply, don't they? Well, it certainly did for me. And and yeah, I think a lot of people uh, it's very, very common in people coming off the drugs that all sorts of hypersensitivities develop. Um, and yeah, you're right. They pathologize really what could be seen as strengths in us and then make them worse and make them a problem. They don't have to be a problem if we find ways of supporting and healing. Some of us need some healing, you know, in my experience and certainly a lot of people's that I work with through the work that I do, you know, this is a global, the name of my blog now is Everything Matters Beyond Meds. And it's everything matters because what I've learned in my healing process is that, you know, we're biological, social, psychological, emotional, uh, uh, social, ecologically oriented beings. All of these aspects matter and coming to alignment and balance with all this stuff together has been important for me. You know, my diet's been important, you know, the state of my mind and my emotions, my relationships, you know, everything is part of what has allowed me to heal. And, um, and those of us who are sensitive need that kind of consciousness to really thrive. And, and it's not, no, there's no one out there helping us figure out how to do that. (laughs) There's definitely no guidebook, is there? And medications can easily make you feel lost in the wilderness, but without realizing why. That's right. And, and I should say, that there's nobody in the social service systems doing that. There are people that are tuned into this stuff, lots of them. And and most of the people that I've learned this stuff from have nothing to do with the mental health system, unfortunately. We have a long way to go, don't we? And Monica, I wanted to ask a bit more about the website Everything Matters Beyond Meds. As we've mentioned, it's a treasure trove of help, advice and support for people. And I just wondered how you came to put it together and how it's developed over the years. Well, well, I had been coming off drugs for three years when I started doing the work. And at the time I was participating online in um, a world of blogs that doesn't really exist anymore since social media came heavily onto the scene. Blogs aren't as important as they used to be. But there was a world of social media was blogs at one time. We People interacted through their blogs, kind of as diaries largely. Or, and then there were some that were more informational or a mixture of both like mine. But uh, there were, anyway, there was a blog that I was centered around called Furious Seasons by Philip Dottie, who did some incredible work. He's not out there doing that this work anymore. He was an actual journalist and wrote really wonderful things. And there were a lot of people coming together being critical of what was happening in psychiatry and, and uh So I was inspired and sharing with a lot of people, and I'd already started coming off drugs, like I said. And my husband has been writing a political website for many, many years, and he was trying to encourage, he was encouraging me to write. And I finally just did. And it just, I never thought about what it was going to become. It was a inspired in the moment work, and it's remained that way. I've never planned much of anything with it. It's, it just grew and it, it was, it was a, organic creation as I became healthy, as I got the toxins out of my body, these drugs, it just, it just grew and became, it's like a, it's a creation of who I really am as a result of finally getting off these drugs. I mean, it feels super just part of this whole process and, and it wouldn't have, 
I, yeah, it's just part of what happened. Well, the organic nature of it really comes across, and it's so refreshing to read real experiences because, again, for me, until recently, I was mired in scientific literature about adverse effects or chemical imbalances and the other myths and fabrications that we were given to justify treatment. But the approach you've taken is so much more inclusive, and to read your kind of approach is reality, isn't it? It's true, but I also do my best to tie things in with with science, but in a different sort of way than, you know, pharma funded clinical trials that, you know, are, you know, biased. It's, it's So, but I do, there is science backing up pretty much of everything I say. And I, I do pull that in with regularity. That's an important point, isn't it? Science should be part of the approach taken, but it shouldn't be to the exclusion of everything else. Well, yeah. And, and I've proven what I need to prove to myself about my body and it doesn't matter what anybody else says. And that's what I try to help others come to. You don't listen to me, listen to your body. And you know, my, my journey is going to be different than yours anyway. This, so, so don't listen to me. I don't, I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone. I'm just sharing my experience and a lot of people it's resonant. It's resonant for a lot of people. And that's it. If people aren't interested or are on a different track, that's totally legitimate too. And uh, that's really important to me. That's great. Thank you. And Monica, I just wanted to ask, in your work to help and guide others, I wondered what your view of psychiatric drugs is given the experiences that you've had. How do you advise people who may be considering taking these medications? Well, I, I generally don't give advice. I listen to people and I let them come to whatever it is they need to come to. I, I, I don't I'm very hands off. Uh, we are harmed because we were coerced. We were coerced to believe that we needed coerced, manipulated. There's, you know, all sorts of explicit and implicit violence and um, force in psychiatry. And most of it's covert. Uh, you just are told that you don't have options and you feel forced to do things. So I'm very respectful of people and everybody's contexts are radically different and people have different means and different internal resources and different capacities and different parts of the country have options that others don't. And, and so I'm very respectful and I answer people's questions. I I am explicit about what happened to me and then the people have a right to choose. And there are times when, because we don't have an infrastructure of care to support alternatives, people feel forced to take drugs. And I'm sure as hell not going to make them feel worse about their condition than they already do if that's the only option that makes any sense to them at this point in time. It's heartbreaking to me to watch people take drugs, but I, I do not stop people from doing what makes sense to them in the context of their lives. That's really important and a world away from when we needed help and were given just one option with little discussion. Right. A lot of people are still only given that and sometimes because of their socioeconomic con- uh, position or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people don't feel they have an option even if they've heard that some exist. And they need to do what they need to do to get through the night. I mean, we're all doing that. We're all trying the best we can. If they, if people have information, then they have the right to make the choice they make and we may not like it. And that's, that's what being respectful of other people is about. Thank you, Monica. And I wondered, clearly many things contributed to your healing journey off the drugs and away from mainstream psychiatry. Was there any one particular thing that you would recommend to people that they should start straight away as part of their healing? I think people tend to neglect their bodies. And I have a post about preparation before people come off drugs. And I think ideally, if people are in a position to uh, prepare, it's it's better that they do. Our bodies are generally kind of trashed to begin with because we haven't been taking care of them and we've been taking neurotoxic drugs on top of it. So this is not something I did or knew how to do. But in retrospect, I would suggest that people look into supporting their bodies in some pretty profound ways before coming off drugs, if they can. There are instances where people cannot. The drugs are so toxic, they've made us so sick that there's not that time or or chance. But in general, I think the body is neglected and we need to tend to it. And that's true of people as they withdraw as well, eating really healthy whole foods, learning what our bodies in particular need, I've needed to detoxify. I've, I've, I had 
really severe and gut issues and I've needed to deal with, you know, longstanding infectious microbes and heavy metals in my brain. That's been a mess. A lot of us become, because we're sensitive and we haven't taken care of our bodies, all these long-term issues uh, just get compounded. And uh, so they really, uh, just tending to the body we, gets neglected a lot. I think that's excellent advice. Thank you. And thank you too for all the help and support that you've given to others because no one could be blamed for turning their back on the world after such awful experiences and not wanting to reach out. But what you've done demands respect. Well, thanks. And I mean, like I said, it's kept me alive. And so it's always been a synergistic thing. And I think that people who need to do other things are called to do different things. It's not, you know, There's no comparison. There's no reason to feel badly if that's not what you feel called to do. We all have different purposes on the planet and jobs to do as our fully developed person within us um, come out. So so, uh, this is what I did and it, it kept me going and it still does. So Well, it's so important and it's helped so many. So I hope that you're aware of how many people rely on that support directly or indirectly. Well, it's, I'm, I'm really grateful that I've helped a lot of people and as I've, and they've, I mean, I just feel like, again, that it's, it's a reciprocal process. Monica, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today for the podcast. It's been a pleasure. All right. Well, that's, that's really nice of you. And, um, I've enjoyed this. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so grateful to Monica for sharing her wisdom and experience with us. Monica's website can be found at beyondmeds.com and if you haven't already visited, I recommend that you do for the wide range of information on many aspects of health and well-being that are covered there. Madden America News and Updates On Madden America this week, Shannon Peters writes about a new study published in the Community Mental Health Journal, which explores the impact of attending English Hearing Voices Network self-help groups on social, emotional and clinical well-being. The results of the survey suggest that attending voice hearing groups provides a venue for meeting other voice hearers, support that voice hearers do not receive from other services, and a safe and confidential space where voice hearers can talk about difficult experiences. The researchers, led by Ellen Eleanor Longdon of the Institute of Psychology, Health and Society at the University of Liverpool in the UK write, It is intuitive that providing a safe communal forum in which individuals assemble to share coping strategies, validate one another's stories and exchange wisdom and insights can reduce shame and isolation and expedite a greater sense of acceptance for an experience that is both distressing and highly stigmatised. Despite the increasing prevalence of hearing voice network self-help groups, there is yet to be a systematic evaluation of these groups. Therefore, the researchers sought to provide the first quantitative survey of hearing voice network self-help groups in order to assess members' perceptions of their impact and effectiveness. The authors emphasise that, while more research is needed on hearing voice network approaches, it is important that this research avoids clinicalization of voice hearer experiences by emphasising outcomes that voice hearers themselves value and identify as relevant, and aiming to understand the broader socio-political issues of identity, citizenship, well-being and empowerment. The researchers also call for more collaboration between hearing voice networks and healthcare workers. They suggest that this would improve referrals from mental health services to hearing voice network groups, as well as improve professionals' knowledge and confidence in working with voice hearers. In upcoming events, July the 26th to the 29th sees the annual William Glasser Institute Conference held at Raleigh, North Carolina. The conference features Robert Whitaker and Dr. Peter Bregin, and to find out more or to sign up, visit the website wglasser.com. On Friday, July the 28th, the Recovery Network of Toronto are holding an Accepting Voices workshop, which offers a human way of understanding the kind of experiences that get called psychosis, and offers a non-diagnostic way of understanding such experiences, and also a better way of understanding how we can support those who live with them. The event is being held at CMHA Durham 60 Bond Street West, Oshawa, Canada. To register, visit the website eventbrite.com, that's eventbrite.com, and search for Accepting Voices, or use the link on the Madden America homepage. Thank you so much for listening today, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.